this morning is from Luke 14, verses 7 to 14, and can be found at the bottom of page 1047. When he noticed how the guests picked their places of honour at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honour, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honoured in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, Then you give a luncheon when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or relatives, or your rich neighbours. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. to pray for Lee now as he brings the Lord's word for us this morning. Father, we thank you that you speak directly to our lives and we thank you for the power of your living word that's living and active, that gets to our very hearts. Lord, we pray that you will speak to us through Lee today, that you will fill him with your spirit, that you'll guide and lead his thinking, that you will take his words and that you will sharpen them so that they get to our very hearts. We pray, Lord, for your power upon him now and your blessing in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. We're going we're gonna to start. My wife gave me a bit of a challenge this morning, and she said, if you were to ask people at the church in that, she thought they'd all favor her. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you a scenario. In the morning... Somebody lovingly prepares you a cup of tea. They bring you the said cup of tea, and they place the cup of tea on the side of your bed. Put your hands up if you would be happy to receive a cup of tea in the morning. Most of you. I think I win that one then. I should also add that if the cup of tea was bought at 10 to 7 in the morning on a Sunday, hands up if you would still be happy. few less of you, but nonetheless, people are still happy. So I was okay bringing the tea at 10 to 7 this morning. I won't do it tomorrow, though, because <laughs> you can only live... Day- Thank you. I'm taking tea orders at the end of the service. I Just as we start, I want to reiterate something that Andrew said this morning and actually how awesome the children have been during August. In August, uh, the team that lead the children uh, and the young people take a break, um, a much needed break, because it's a very small team, so they end up doing lots and lots of weeks. Um, But children, you've all been absolutely fantastic. You've been so well behaved, and you've really listened, and you've really participated. It's been actually great having you with the whole church, rather than always being separated off. So well done for, for how you've been. And particularly for the children's team leaders, the adults, those of you that have had to put up with being in church over the summer as well, we're starting back next week, so you, can, you don't have to be in church every week. So children's team, you can quickly go back next week. Now, this passage that we're going to look at this morning is one of those passages, like many of the different things that Jesus said, there's more to it than first meets the eye. There's different ways you can read the Bible. You can read the Bible and think, yep, I understand what that says. Or you can dig a little bit deeper and you can realize there's more going on here. Now, to introduce this, because I'm a simple bloke, I thought I'd start with a little illustration. I'm going to show you a little video that I came across this week. I found it hysterically funny, um, so please laugh. 
But this little video is just going to show you that there's more going on than you first see. Okay, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll have seen from that video that what the guy thought he was seeing wasn't quite what he was seeing. Now, we all know a friend like that, don't we? The one that, you know, you physically take your finger out and point to it, and they're still trying to work out how to remove your finger. Well, the reason I thought I'd introduce you to that is, as I said a moment ago, sometimes when you first read something that Jesus says, there's more going on under the surface when you really have a look at it. Now, Jesus had uh, been invited to a meal and meals figure quite a lot in the scriptures, as do wedding feasts, actually. But Jesus had been invited to this meal, and he was observing people. And uh, he still does that today. There's a wonderful verse in uh, Proverbs, which will just pop up on the, on the screen for me. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. Now picture the scene. Jesus is at the meal. He's watching people and he's observing them. And I wonder what he's seeing. He's probably seeing that some people, as it says in the thing, they take the best seats. Andrew, uh, in church this morning, has the best seats because he's on the middle row and he's right at the front. And he's obviously not a real Anglican because he wouldn't be sat on the middle front row if he was because that's the place. The real Anglicans are on the back, aren't they, Philippa? Fantastic. <laughs> But Jesus is observing these people, and he's noticing how they try to take the positions near the head of the table. Now, to understand that, you need to understand why some of these social occasions took place. Why were these meals happening? Why did people invite others to their houses for a meal? And to understand that, you need to know a little bit about the Middle East at that time. These kind of meals were real social climbing events. The religious leaders, the teachers of the law, those in society who were kind of a little bit higher up than the normal man on the street would invite others to their house. And they'd start off by, they'd invite people very similar to them. So if I was to invite people today, I'd invite people like Steve and Nigel and Debbie and Julie and Richard, just people who I would consider friends, people who are kind of, you know, I'd invite all of you actually, just there's no favoritism there, okay? <laughs> But you'd also invite people who were a little bit higher in social standing than you. So for us, it might be a local councillor, it might be the local head teacher, any teacher actually, because they're you know, really high up on the teachers, they're fantastic. Okay? But you'd invite people who were slightly higher up the social order than yourself. And the reason you would do this is because you knew in return that they would invite you back. Now, how many people have been invited to someone's house for a meal, and deep down, you kind of want to be invited back. Come on, show of hands. How many people invite people, and deep down you want to be invited back? You're the only one, Andrew. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, and Anos. Anos, okay. But it's what happened. You invited people higher up than you, so they would then invite you, and then what that would do, that would lift you a little bit higher in the social order. Other people would see, oh, look, they've been, invi they've been invited to Glynn's house. Did you see that? You know, they've been invited, to because that's what happened. They got invited by people slightly higher up, and it elevated them in society. And this would keep going, actually. You'd invite more people higher up, you'd get invited to theirs, then you'd meet new people there, you'd invite them, and it, and it would keep happening. 
And Jesus would have been most likely invited because he was considered to be a religious leader. But there was probably another meaning there. The local people, the local teachers of law, would have wanted to really see, what is this Jesus all about? You know, they've been seeing what he's been doing, and they weren't happy with some of the things he had been doing. So they invited him because they would have wanted to observe him. And it looks initially in the passage that basically Jesus just seems to offer some good advice. But we know with Jesus that very often what he says, there's always another meaning, isn't there? And it wasn't just good advice that Jesus was offering them. He wasn't just saying to them, well, take a lower place at the table, because actually if, uh, if somebody more important than you was to walk in, you wouldn't be embarrassed. Now, I've picked on Andrew already this morning, so I'm going to do it again. Okay, let's just imagine Andrew has come and sat right at the front of the church this morning because he considers, you know, I'm, I'm in the worship team. Everyone knows that the worship team are the elite in the church. Okay, and let's imagine that Andrew's taken that place because he knows it's the most important place. But then what happens is the vicar walks in and the vicar's wife, just, just pretend for a minute the vicar's wife isn't as humble and hum, has much humility as she does. She's a very humble lady. She always sits at the back. But let's imagine that Glyn takes his wife by the hands and says, actually, darling, I want you... You do realize you have a woman, don't you? Because you've implied earlier that... Yeah, okay. All right? You d he takes her by the hand and he says, I'm sorry, Andrew, but you're going to have to move because my wife needs to sit there. Now, Andrew, as a member of the worship team, is going to be slightly embarrassed. And he's going to be like, oh, dear. And uh, Keiko would probably tell him when he got home, you should not have sat in the front of the church... You should have sat in the middle. You've made it, you've embarrassed us. But that's what would have happened. People would have been invited in who were slightly higher. And Jesus was saying, don't take the most important place. Take the humble place. Deliberately choose a lower place. But Jesus was actually teaching them something beyond that. In Jesus' day, there were religious leaders who were jostling for position. They were keeping to the letter of the law to the very full stop. They were being immaculate in the way they followed the law. But not just the law. They'd made up all these other regulations and traditions that had been handed down. And Jesus was saying, that's not how you come to God. It's not about jostling for position and making yourself all important and making a big show of your faith. It's actually about being humble. It's about willing to put others before yourself. And these people were, in effect trying to earn their way to God. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to earn your way into doing something, earn yourself into maybe somebody's good books. Earlier today, I did get told off for making uh, my wife a cup of tea early, and I probably should have added that I had to wake her up to do it. And then I should have added that I came back, plonked myself into bed, and started eating my toast, and I'm quite a noisy eater. So it probably wasn't the nicest way to wake her up in the morning. Okay? But... You can't earn your way back into favor with God. Now, since then, I've been really nice to Trish, and uh, I've not embarrassed her in church this morning or anything like that. So I'm trying to earn my favor back with her. But people were trying to earn their favor with God, and, God, and you, know, you can't do that, can you? The Bible tells us, doesn't it? Okay? We, don't, we can't have pride. We can't have pride. And I love that saying, pride notoriously is the great cloud which bl blots out the sun of God's generosity. And the scriptures tell us that it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now the religious leaders at the time, they got all this wrong, they were trying to earn this. But people, we can't earn this, we can't earn God's favour. We don't deserve it anyway, to be honest, we don't deserve God's favour, we cannot earn it. It is a gift. But the people at the time that would have been at the meal that Jesus was at, they were so intent on earning it. They thought, you know, if they kept every letter of the law, if they obeyed everything that, that the law said, which is all good, but they thought it was something that they earned rather than something they were given. Now, the second part of this passage, Jesus goes on, and he goes a little bit deeper. Because sometimes when you read Scripture, you think, yeah, yeah, I've got that. I understand now what, what Jesus was saying. But then you read a little bit more and you think, I've got a feeling he's got a little bit more to say here. So we're going to go just a little bit deeper. In the second part of the passage, Jesus goes on to challenge the kind of people who are invited to the banquets. Jesus said to invite the, the lame, the blind, 
the crippled. People who were the complete opposite to who people would have invited to their meals. But so often we see with Jesus, don't we, that he actually turns the worldly system, the worldly values, completely upside down. I remember years ago reading a book called The Upside Down Kingdom. And actually Jesus' kingdom really is upside down because all the things you would associate with somebody of power and royalty and somebody as unique and amazing as Jesus, Jesus turns upside down. And he started that when he left the right hand of God and he came down to earth as a tiny little baby born in a, in a manger, a place that animals ate out of. So we know with Jesus that he doesn't always do things by the book or by our book, but he does do them by his book, his word. But again, this was a parable. So Luke, who wrote this parable, would have had an understanding as he wrote it that actually Jesus was also saying to the people at the time that actually the people you invite to your meals are those that are the same as you. They would be other Jewish people, other Jewish leaders, other respectable Jewish people. But Luke knew that when Jesus came, he also came for the Gentiles, those who actually were outside of the Jewish faith, the Jewish religion. And they were considered the equivalent of the lame, the poor. They were not spoken about. They were not spoken to. But Luke would have had the understanding that actually Jesus came for them as well. He came for everyone. And there were many non-Jews, when Luke would have been writing this, who were actually coming to faith. And there would have been a lot of Jewish people that didn't like that. And it very clearly points out in God's word that actually, in God's eyes, all are welcome. Now as I was preparing this, I always like to ask, um, it's always a good thing to do, ask Jesus, ask God, what do you want to say to us through this passage? Because you can have, you know, fantastic Bible knowledge and you can understand the scriptures but actually if you don't apply it if you don't start living by what it says then it's just head knowledge isn't it you know I could be an amazing teacher I'm not I'm not even a teacher but if you can have all of that knowledge if you can have all of that uh, education in your head but actually you're not living it out you're not teaching people about it and we've got a number of teachers in 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 church and you know Guys, if you were to just know everything and you've been away to university and you've learned all the stuff you need to know, but you don't teach people it, you don't actually use it, it's just head knowledge, isn't it? And it can be like that with the scriptures. So I really prayed and I listened and I asked God, what do you want to say to us at Christ Church today about this? And I really felt quite strongly that what what the Lord laid on my heart was something that, that Glyn has been talking about quite a lot recently. And it's really exciting the stage we're at with it. But quite soon, we're going to start going out, knocking on doors. Now, to anybody that's ever been door knocking, and I can remember doing this as a 13-year-old boy uh, with, a, with a, a few other people from our church. And we actually had a really, really good, good, amazing response, actually. But I think times are changing, actually. I think people are less, in many ways, they know less about faith. There's no experience through maybe having gone to Sunday school on that. So in many, days, many ways, it's actually quite exciting because we're going out with a bit of a, a blank canvas, in a way. But I really felt God challenge me and say, well, what would happen if when the church goes out knocking on doors, people start responding? And actually, not only do people respond, but people come along to the Alpha course. And then actually, people go on the Alpha course and they find Jesus. And when they find Jesus, they decide that actually they want to start coming along regularly to worship at Christ Church. And then I really felt the Lord to say, well, how would we all feel at Christ Church if they were different to us? They came into the church and they were very, very different to us. And then I thought, well, what if they came in and they were really, really poor? And maybe, you know, they're the kind of people that society shuns. Other people don't have time for. What What if they were Muslim? What if they come from a completely different faith background to us? What if they were covered in tattoos and had loads of body piercing? Because we all know that people with tattoos are well dodgy. Okay? What if they came in with inappropriate clothes? What if they weren't dressed in a way that was acceptable to be dressed in church? 
Because we all know there's certain things you don't wear in church, aren't there? You don't wear shorts in church if you're a man. Anybody ever wore shorts in church? Anybody wearing shorts in church? Okay. Trevor surprises me. Okay. What if they sat in your seat in church? How many people, if they want to be honest, if you came into church and where you regularly sat, your row, because I don't think we're quite that church, so you always have the same seat, but they were in your row at church and you saw somebody come in, your first thought would be, how exciting, new people in church. Or your first thought might be, how dare they? I've sat there since the church opened. That is not acceptable. But then I felt God go on to say something a little bit more challenging, actually. And when I say what I'm about to say, I'm actually speaking to the people who are regular members at this church or people who love and follow Jesus. Because what would happen if these people who came to faith did what the very early people that came to know Jesus did? When people came to know Jesus, when they accepted Jesus, they were passionate about it. They wanted to go off and change the world. They wanted to go off and tell everybody they met about Jesus. They wanted to tell everybody they met the difference meeting this man, who was God in human form, had done. And what if the new people that came into the church were like that? They were really passionate and they wanted to turn things upside down. They wanted to share their faith. Would we be ready for that? Or when they came into this church and they meet us, and by us I mean all of us, what are they going to see? Are they going to see a bunch of people who are passionately following Jesus Christ? A group of people who passionately engage with God's word. And by that I mean they know it. If they were to look at your Bibles, they'd think, well, they need to replace that. They're really old and tatty. The kind of people that when they watch us worshipping, they don't just see us doing what I call the teenage worship pose. Where we just mouth some words but people who are engaging with worship now I know that we're all different when we worship some people like to move, some people like to use their hands, some people like to dance and we're all different, I'm not judging anybody if you're one of these people that just enjoy standing and really focusing and singing the words others can tell if you mean it by the way you sing it but if you're just mumbling a few words then it's just singing, it's not worship But what will these people see when they come up? Will they see a group of people who, when they wake up in the morning, the first thing on their mind isn't, wow, I've got a cup of tea, but, wow, morning Jesus, another day you've given me. People who, when they go to the school gates, when they go to the office, when they go to the factory, when they see their neighbours, on their mind constantly is, Jesus, show me how to change them, show me how to teach them about you. Because if people come into our church, when we go around knocking on doors, and they come into a church that's not passionate about Jesus, not passionate about his word, it's going to be like we're just going to pour cold water on them. They're going to come in on fire and want to know more about Jesus, and they'll come into church, and we'll just be like a watering can. We'll just be putting some of it out. And I'm not saying this to judge us, because I looked at myself when I said this, and I said, actually, it's the way I'm living my life pointing others to Jesus because Glyn I don't know if you've noticed Glyn is not the kind of vicar that's just come in and just going to be kind of let's just take it nice and easy and be a nice cosy comfy little fellowship and uh, we'll just sit together nicely in the church and we'll sing and we'll study the Bible and we'll close the doors in case anybody hears us because if that's the kind of vicar you think we've got (laughs) you ain't seen nothing yet okay because He's already, in a matter of months, getting us going outside, knocking on doors. He's already inviting people to come in and hear about Jesus. But let's be the kind of church that when people come in, when we go out, they look at us and go, wow, I want what they've got. Now I'm going to quote a really biblical scriptural film now. How many of you have ever seen that film with Meg Ryan? I forget what it was called. Somebody help me. Film with Meg Ryan. And there's that really, really good scene where when Harry met... Thank you, Julie. When Harry met Sally. I won't mention the scene, but there's one bit where she does stuff and somebody else turns around and says, I want what she's had, or I want what she's having. 
Let's be the kind of church that when people look at us, they go, I want what they've got. And let's be the kind of church that give them what we've got. I'm just going to pray. Jesus, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you that as with so much of your word, there's always more to it when we really get to grips with it. And Lord, I want to say that we love your word and we want to live by it. But make us more like Jesus. Where we've maybe grown a little bit cold, where we've been lukewarm, fire us up again. When we wake up in the morning, Lord, just be the first thing on our mind. Jesus, make us the people you want us to be, to go out and do the things you want us to do. Amen.